Okay, so it's 2.30, and I think I'm going to start with, um, with an introduction. Um, those that have joined this Zoom call, I, I'd like to welcome you to the first Brockhouse uh, Institute for Materials Research seminar for the 2021-2022 season. Uh, I'm really excited to finally have the Brockhouse Institute seminars start up again. We've uh, had more than a year of uh, no seminars and now we're starting back up. Um, unfortunately, we have to still do it virtually, but hopefully in the near future we will uh, start to have in-person seminars as well. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Jason Hine from the University of British Columbia. Uh, Professor Hine uh, received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Manitoba in the year 2000. He then completed his PhD also at the University of Manitoba in 2005 under the supervision of Philip Halton. Um, having finished his PhD, he uh, was very successful in receiving his uh, receiving an NSERC postdoctoral fellowship to pursue postdoctoral studies at the Scripps Research Institute under the supervision of Barry Sharpless and Valerie Fokin. Uh, he was there for a number of years and then became a research assistant associate in um, Donna Blackman's lab, also at Scripps, where I believe he developed uh, a lot of his skills and interests in reaction monitoring and mechanistic investigations of, uh, of reactions. After that, he began his uh, independent career with the his first assistant professor position at the University of California, Merced, in 2011. And a few years later, he was recruited to the University of British Columbia, where he started as an assistant professor in 2015 and has stayed ever since. Um, at UBC, he has established a really exciting group uh, focused on um, a number of really interesting topics including reaction monitoring, mechanistic analysis, and um, uh, laboratory automation. He has a group of about 25 people and uh, if you go on his website it's very impressive. He has videos of all sorts of interesting lab automation kind of tools that uh, have been developed in his lab. And so I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Hein um, to the seminar series, and uh, he'll be presenting his talk entitled New Tools and Technology to Accelerate Process Chemical Research and Discovery. Professor Hein, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you guys today. Um, in, in, to try and sort of focus on uh, the, the theme, both in, in terms of uh, automation and automation acceleration, I want to kind of give you a perspective on um, the tools that we build, kind of how we do them, but also uh, a little bit of an idea of like, why we select these things to do uh, automation. Function at the end of the day, automation is, I am still a physical organic chemist, despite what uh, uh, our sort of our, our suite of, 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 of research kind of looks like. Everything we do, these tools we build is in service of that. So really just to, to kind of focus on that sort of context. Um, why is that not? Okay, there we go. Um, where this is sort of, uh, again, conceptually starts off is if you just imagine um, graphically what we have to do and how much it, it takes to get there. Um, the, this, this normal sort of Gantt chart has, has compressed over the years. What we first have is, is an elevated level of complexity and pressure and the challenges have gotten higher, so the bar has been accelerated. At the same time, um, we are losing time. Uh, the, the, if you look in the space of pharmaceutical development, which is a lot of what we do, uh, there's, there's an increased pressure on, on getting things done quicker. Uh, as a result of these two factors, right? Harder problems and, and, and we've gotta go, go quicker. We've led to this, uh, this information gap. We have to do more with, uh, with less, uh, less time, less uh, uh, resources. And as a result of that, that's that sort of context that um, we build uh, these toolkits. We use this kind of a, a visualization that, that acceleration of what we're doing is, is, is really the, the mark for, for why these tools have to exist. Uh, as far as problems go, though, it's, it's very broad. Uh, we're talking about uh, application, this just general concept of, of doing things better, faster. 
and it covers uh, all kinds of challenges. If you just look at this last year, two sort of grand challenges that we've uh, been facing. First of all, the global pandemic. This is a, a case where science had to rapidly accelerate and, and meet uh, an international challenge. And, and the success stories are, are many, right? As much as this has been a tough year, uh, just in the chemical space, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen, but follow the story behind how remdesivir, a molecule which was initially designed for the, the, the treatment of, of Ebola, was rapidly pivoted, scaled, and then delivered as a, as a first-line treatment in a very short time. And then in addition to that, it's the MRA, that mRNA vaccines and, and the, the sort of the global uh, supply chain that goes behind that is a, is a wonderful example of people from interdisciplinary backgrounds pulling together for this. At the same time, uh, global climate change is, is something that we've experienced heavily. This year uh, in BC, we had the deadliest heat wave we've ever seen, the highest recorded temperatures in all of Canada. Uh, and, and what that means is, again, the, our entire sort of uh, energy economy and, and how, we, how everything goes in our society has to pivot. So even if you focus only on that, uh, that idea of solar capture by new materials, uh, perovskite solar cells, there's a huge lift that needs to be done that just focuses on doing that better so that we have a, a more robust energy solutions. And again, these are things that are not as easy done as a single component, right? These are massive teams of people from injury similar backgrounds that are necessary to, to make uh, headway in all these. From my perspective as a, a process chemist, what I'm really talking about is, is synthesis. And that means making a material or a compound and understanding how one did it, not just for replication, but for things like manufacturing and, and control. And, in my very simple world, what that means is I want to have a reaction and I want to see what's happening inside that reaction. I want to be able to trend the concentration versus time profiles of what's in that system so that I, I can exert my, my own control and selectivity. Uh, it's not that easy though. In fact, in order to get between the reaction and the visualization, there's a whole suite of analytical and, and um, other tools that are necessary to really be able to do this. Because um, one of the problems you can imagine is if I'm doing a reaction and I don't sample it properly, if I mess up the system just by doing that analysis or the way that I do the analysis perturbs or changes the system, I'm, I'm measuring a model system that has no bearing on how the actual manufacturing case would actually look. So we have to come up with this suite of technology in the middle that allows us to truly study the process in its close to a real world situation that we would actually sort of get to. How we approach it from my lab is we bring together a whole series of interdisciplinary teams. So this is where our pits, bits and pieces uh, uh, focus on applications in process chemistry and engineering. That's our, sort of our major driver. But we apply things like custom automation, uh, tools from analytical chemistry and, and computer science in order to bring these sort of challenges together. So the driver here is still always this idea of, of make something new and make it as, as efficiently as possible. But it's, it's also within the context of you bringing these other tools together. Now, I cannot do this without the amazing team I have. I'm actually very fortunate to have uh, a very interdisciplinary team of people that cover backgrounds from uh, data science, mechatronics, uh, synthetic chemistry. And, and it's really, I look at our lab as a sort of a, uh, a fostering this kind of a, an interdisciplinary co collaboration. The problems that uh, I'll discuss today all were the result of bringing together this very diverse set of teams and actually fostering that communication between disparate backgrounds. That's honestly one of the biggest things that we face is solutions from the data science area are, are, are ready to go, yet the conversation of how that solution is then translated into something that uh, a synthetic chemist could use, uh, those are still lacking. So uh, what we uh, look at this, and again, to sort of set some context for the, the talk today, I wanna to give you some background papers uh, that, that kind of tell you a little bit about what's been going on in my lab. Uh, the first is really around that sort of analytical tool chain. That's how do we adapt the tools we have in order to visualize a reaction? And I'll talk about this in more detail, but uh, we've really become um, experts at monitoring a reaction live in real time by HPLC. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that is, but if you're interested in, in sort of the, the whole sort of history of this, uh, this is a good paper to start off with. It's a recent paper in ACS Vitalysis. Uh, we're able to put together a system to study some chemistry inside a glove box. So in fact, very remote or inaccessible environments. The second is really just adapting. So this is really the hat that we play with with automation. Uh, getting a, a reaction to be executed by laboratory robotics um, is, is not an easy task unless you have sort of bits and pieces or Lego blocks you can assemble together to, to do any experiment. 
So the concept we really have applied here is that um, automation can be done by building out these unit modules and then by rearranging what those modules and how they work together, you can come up with, uh, with new uh, data, uh, experimental streams. And one example of this is our iScience paper where we actually put together a system that was capable of powder dosing, liquid dosing, and visualization analysis using computer vision to, to measure the solubility of a compound. This is a fundamental colligative property, but, but very challenging uh, without any calibration or other sort of other backline analytics. We just use the simple idea of if I see that it's not dissolved, then I need to do something about it. So uh, it's, this is an example of how that modularity can be brought together rapidly. At the same time, one of the other things that we do is, is at the interface of, of uh, action or using these, these automations. So an example of this is our JCAM Ed article where we were asking the question, if we had this automated tool chain together, how does a, an average user use it? And we wanted to have a very simple interface. So in fact, this was an example where we hacked uh, Siri so that you could use voice command to actually run the automation over Zoom. And then we actually came up with a, a very simple titration experiment that first year students could do without ever having to have uh, knowledge of things like Python or the background code. They could simply ask the automation to do certain experiments in the same way you would with a, with a collaborative uh, a, a person or something. And then finally, um, the bigger piece of where does all this automation sort of fit within uh, acceleration science, um, fundamentally automation feeds data into uh, these sorts of systems. And as, as data science and chemistry become more closely matched, data is the thing that these, uh, these algorithms, ML sort of things and AI toolkits actually can need to consume. And automation has a major uh, uh, stake in this point because it allows not only high volumes, but very accurate and well, well uh, documented data to be fed into these for, so for more robust sort of actions and utilization. So uh, check out this uh, uh, Accounts Chemical Research article. Uh, this is our sort of perspective, but the entire issue is actually on this data science meets chemistry sort of piece. And there's some very interesting uh, uh, papers that are represented there too. Uh, as, as, as it was mentioned too, um, we do have, and this is from being in the pandemic, we are now um, YouTubers. So we do actually have a YouTube channel for the lab. I encourage you to, to uh, first like and subscribe. I'm, I'm required to say those things, but at the same time, um, it, it's a really interesting way. I think that for other people that are that have thought, is this possible to come and take a look? What we often publish here is just things that we're doing around the lab to show off what can be possible. And in this case, this is a demonstration up here. It, it's a little bit of a, a it's a, a bit of a joke where we've got these two disparate robotic systems. These are two of our six axis arms, Universal Robotics over here and the Canova platform over here. But what we're getting them to do is collaborate. In this case, uh, the, the sort of script we're running is that one is asking the other one out uh, for Valentine's Day. But behind this, what we're trying to show off is that we have the big capabilities now to get isolated disparate systems that have totally different sort of programming code to work together. And it's this collaboration space that allows us to do some really interesting things. So, so these kinds of parts are not only to, to sort of show off what's possible, but they're good test cases for us to start thinking outside the box of how we might do things around the lab. So on, on the first topic, I just want to talk about um, our online HPLC work. And really what we're doing here is uh, visualizing the reaction in real time using HPLC. Now we focus on HPLC primarily because Unlike a lot of other analytical tools, uh, almost all organic reactions can be visualized by HPLC, either with a different phase or a different uh, um, mobile phase or, or, or slightly different to tweaks to the detector. Every reaction will give you some sort of signals by HPLC, and that's both concentration and also uh, composition, different components. Now, online HPLC in particular is really important because if you wanna know the true sort of uh, disposition of a reaction, uh, we just, we want to be able to run it, grab time points, and immediately visualize them by HPLC. And in that sort of case, in this online mode, uh, this was a demonstration by my student, Melody Christensen, where the online HPLC of the Suzuki reaction shows you very clear trends of, look, we have activation, there's an induction period, it goes through steady states, and then we have our product distribution. If you take those same samples and visualize them in offline, in other words, after the reaction is done, we take those same samples and then rerun them on the HPLC, not only do we get a uh, higher scatter, but we start seeing changes in, in the information. We no longer see that induction period, the reaction endpoint uh, looks different. Um, what's happening here is we have this added degree of analytical complication where the quench must be perfect. You have to freeze the reaction in time if we're gonna use this offline mode. 
So while HPLC is super valuable, adding this online element adds a sort of a level of complexity and a level of sophistication that's really valuable for, for monitoring reactions. It also simplifies things. Um, we've built hundreds of different sort of characteristics of, of these, uh, these kind of LC online uh, monitoring systems. And just a, a couple um, are sort of cited here over the last couple of years. Most importantly, again, I think we've gotten to the case now where we can actually build that uh, analytical uh, automation as a, into isolated environments that are much harder to interface with. So in fact, uh, this, this first paper here in ACS Catalysis, we're actually doing monitoring of a pyrophoric system inside a glove box, but visualizing real time by, by HPLC. So it, it, it's really uh, powerful in terms of what we can actually accomplish now. At the heart of all of this is the probe. So how we actually get a sample out of a reaction and then the back end transfer. Uh, the, the key is getting that sample out of the reaction um, without any problems. And how we do this is we actually have this uh, probe made by Metler Toledo. What we can do here is this probe has an internal, so we're looking at the cutaway. It has this internal uh, pin, which is ejected from the reaction. It exposes a pocket, which then passively picks up sample from the reaction environment. It's then withdrawn and then quenched inside that probe head. So that means that we can have things like slurries. We can have oxygen sensitive materials. We can have cryogenic or, or high temperature, high pressure materials. And we're withdrawing it and quenching the reaction in the native environment of the reaction. So it's very powerful for how we can start to deploy this. The, the, re the requirement is still, we have to put this probe inside a reaction. There are complications because of that, but it really opens up the possibility of what we can do in terms of sample acquisition. Once it's in this kind of a space, it's just a sample in line. There's hundreds of things we can do with it after that point. So the first thing I want to show you through is, is how we've applied this to the uh, synthesis and optimization of what's called a whole transport material. Now, in a perovskite solar cell, sort of diagrammed out here, the whole transport material is just a polycyclic uh, electron-dense uh, organic uh, conductive material, uh, in this case, spiroomatad. It uh, sits here between the electrode and the perovskite, the, the sort of photo layer, and its job is to pass uh, charge, in this case, uh, positive charge or holes, right? So it, we need these kinds of materials because they're a critical component of these, uh, these thin and flexible solar cells. The downside is that material itself, its characteristics, its synthesis must be uh, very, very, uh, very high purity, uh, very cheap and, and very high fidelity if we're ever gonna make this material into actual commodity chemicals. So the, the, just being able to do small scale batches is one thing for synthesis, but at the same time, um, if this is going to be a real world uh, application, the, the, the sophistication and, and ability of this thing to be synthesized really needs to be elevated. Uh, just in terms of the types of molecules, spiromatad is one of the champion materials, both in terms of electronic and physical characteristics. But many other groups have sort of been um, entertained over the years. In particular, people focus on spiromatad because it has been adopted as, uh, as, as, again, one of the sort of best balances between different people or different uh, components. However, different core modifications like these xanthone derivatives or potentially these unsymmetrical sort of compounds where you may have, let's say, a donor acceptor uh, characteristic built to it really could potentially give um, some very interesting properties. The challenge there becomes understanding how to do the synthesis to give you these more bespoke materials uh, in that case. So understanding the mechanism and just generally how this reaction works really helps to unlock uh, the, the synthetic workspace, what, ex what experiments we can run, but also uh, potentially allows us to manufacture materials like this to a, to a higher level. Uh, just generally, how the spiroomatad comes together now is this tetrabrominated material. Uh, we carry out four CN cross couplings using palladium uh, uh, cross coupling. This is a buckwell hartwig type amination to give you your final product. And you can see that there's uh, some interesting things here. Having a polyhalogenated material like this means we have to do four CN uh, cross-coupling events. And if every one of those CBR bonds, you can think of it as a liability, every time we do one of those reactions, there's a possibility that something will go wrong. The, the bromination will, will fail, you get a hydrogen insertion or, or something to that effect. And what that means is we need all four of them to work perfectly to high degree of fidelity with very low catalyst loading. And if that's not the case, we're making mixtures of, of products. So just thinking of it as these single events, as you do this, this, uh, this component, you start with your tetrabromine material, substitute one. The second substitution actually has two regiochemical uh, differentiation, so on the same ring or opposite ring. And further, this compound here is actually axially chiral, right? It, we differentiated uh, the, the stereochemistry here. 
And then finally, the tri substituted and then tetra. So if any of these steps is, is beginning to fail, you end up with a, a breakfast of different materials. Um, one thing we wanted to do, though, is, is we looked at this as one way we could potentially uh, control this is by using what's called ring walking. Ring walking is a, a terminology where multiple cross-coupling events can happen where the catalyst never leaves the pi system. And this is something that's been visualized uh, with other polyhalogenase systems for CC cross-coupling. So these molecules here start off as a dihalogenated uh, substrate where a Suzuki reaction is used to rapidly get di substitution without this kind of stepwise type behavior. So it does exist and seen in things like um, carbon-carbon polymerization for, for conductive electronic materials. So it, it, this can be utilized, but it's never been seen in like a CN uh, cross-coupling kind of a world. What we mean by this ring walking is you think about the mechanism. We start with our palladium zero. We undergo uh, a coordination and an oxidative addition where one of those halogens is now substituted. So we have our, our palladium two species. Uh, amine coordination and base deprotonation gives us something ready for reductive elimination, which gives us our CN bond. Now, at this stage here, at the palladium, that last compound, the palladium is still coordinated to the pi system. And normally, if we were to dissociate, we could start this process again in that sort of iterative or stepwise kind of way. However, if this uh, complex has the right kind of life cycle, we can undergo a ring walking event where the palladium never leaves that pi system, it remains coordinated. And we rapidly CN, uh, uh, do another oxidative addition, we functionalize the other side of the pi system. So this way we don't see partially substituting intermediates. It drastically uh, simplifies the problem and it gives us a control element that we could use for, for very specific kinds of substitution patterns. Um, so the, the interesting thing is, in fact, just a quick uh, study uh, showed that it actually works. And what's interesting, if you start with this tetrabromidated material and we do our cross-coupling using uh, tributylphosphine as our, as our reagent under these uh, lithium HMDS conditions. In fact, we only see one intermediate and one product. So the HPLC time course here shows our tetrabromidate material being consumed. This uh, yellow trend here is our intermediate, and then the product is slowly growing in. So we don't have this high degree of complexity that we thought we could run into if you have the right kind of catalyst and ligand environment. Most importantly though, this uh, intermediate we are able to isolate and crystallize it to confirm that, in fact, it's this specific disubstituted product where both of the bromines on the same aromatic fluorine system have been replaced, not across the two rings. And that speaks to that we're dealing with this, this ring walking type event. We're functionalizing both things on the same uh, pi system first. So this is interesting because now we have this control element. We confirm that it's possible. What we want to look into is as we change the chemistry, could we actually uh, either stop at that point, stop at this intermediate and then divert it off, but also could we use it to potentially arrest or, or not do that ring walking kind of event. What we found is, in fact, if we uh, go to things like uh, Xantfox, dye substituted uh, type ligands, what we can get is turn off ring walking. And what we now have is this sequential mono, dye, tri, and then finally spiro kind of behavior. Interesting thing, the dye substituted uh, product we formed here is actually the opposite uh, face ones. We actually get dye substitution between the two rings, not across the same aromatic system. So what that speaks to is that we're getting an oxidative or reductive elimination and then migration to actually stereo control to the, or steric control over to the other ring system. So it's a really uh, different sort of control element. So having both of these two kind of modes means that we can actually start to address very different substitution patterns just by changing the ligand in the catalyst system. Um, it's, it's not unique to sort of that uh, tributylphosphine one. In fact, these kind of hyperpepsi kind of systems are also very high uh, fidelity for these uh, uh, intermediate and then final one by this ring walking kind of event. And, and we've worked out conditions now where we can start to try and uh, uh, at least uh, maximize the concentration of this intermediate. We haven't found a way to completely arrest that sort of secondary substitution, but by understanding the ring substitute, the, uh, the, the kinetics of the system, we can tune it to uh, to be lean on certain materials and have it uh, form that intermediate as a major product. And that gives us access to uh, these orthogonally substituted uh, materials down the line. It also opens up to other cores. So in this case, if we wanted to go to that xanthone core, which is actually considered to be sort of a next generation material, you have the same problem. You start with a tetrabrominated material, but now you've got differentiation top and bottom. And what happens there is that the, the possibility of, of, of materials just explodes. Now, instead of just those kind of intermediates, we have a lot of different regiochemical and stereochemical differentiation where, where, where the, the reaction is, is, is very differentiated uh, in this case. 
Uh, the nice thing though, uh, just as a quick uh, snapshot is our, our HPLC time course allows us to visualize each of these stepwise events. We can actually see the formation and, and sort of evolution of the reactions we move between them. But again, this is a level of depth of visualization of reaction, which is not possible without the tools we have. We haven't gone uh, a lot deeper yet uh, in terms of the control elements, but it's having this tool means that we can look inside a system and ask direct questions instead of just saying, well, I'll mix these things. What do I get as an outcome? The, the, the time course analysis gives us another degree of depth. So switching gears now into another material and where we've used this online analysis, uh, this is in our, to some of our work with uh, lithium isolation and crystallization. So lithium is uh, critically important as a battery material. And in particular, the last couple of years, um, lithium's involvement in the electronic vehicle market is, has been really the, the heavy driver. So as we switch over to an economy where uh, uh, mobilization and then not so much storage technology, but definitely mobile energy is going to use uh, more uh, lithium battery technology. There's a, a higher demand on having very high purity uh, lithium for, for manufacturing these materials. Now, how it's isolated right now, primarily your two sources are hard rock mining, which have a whole lot of problems associated with it from an energy impact and a water impact point of view. Brine deposits are a lot more interesting, except again, there's some challenges around isolation and purification because you're, you're taking this geological brine, you usually have to strip the water out of it, that takes energy and time. And then also, again, there's, there's, there's geological uh, problems of, of flooding uh, large areas and, and, and land impact. Um, the project we've been involved with it involves a, a local company called Standard Lithium, where what they did is partner with uh, a company in, uh, in uh, Arkansas, which actually runs a bromine extraction facility on a lithium rich brine. So the current process has a well in place, which simply pumps up the lithium brine. It uh, does bromine extraction. And originally they were returning that lithium rich brine back into the ground. They were only extracting the bromine and putting it back. What standard lithium identified is here's a way to bolt on a process to an existing uh, installation. It requires no more mining, no more wells have to be drilled. We simply just bolt onto their waste stream into a lithium extraction. So this is an ion exchange process, which then we couple in and we get this lithium chloride solution out, in which case uh, that's where my group's uh, involvement really kicks in. It's in the second part. How do we take that lithium chloride solution and now polish it and, and purify it as a crystallization initiative? Uh, what we decided to, to uh, work on was actually this very simple sort of workflow. The brine feed from that exchange process is passed through to our, our technology. We carry a softening, which is just adding sort of a carbonate by either uh, potassium or sodium carbonate. Uh, we then carry out this uh, temperature controlled uh, continuous crystallization where we isolate the, uh, the lithium uh, carbonate uh, pure crystals filtered and then give our high purity material. The interesting thing about all this, though, is this is a continuous process with many variables changing. You have a material coming out of the ground, the lithium chloride solution, where the ion composition changes quite frequently depending on what's happening in the process. If the whole continuous plant is going to work efficiently, what you need is inline analysis to know where you are so that how the plant has to behave. So in this case, we use two critical tools. One of them is inline uh, microscopy. So this allows us to visualize the crystallization in real time. And then second is ion chromatography. So what we do is we have our standard ion chromatogram. This tells us concentration and composition of our, our, our cations. And we built a, a system that allows uh, automatic sampling, dilution, and preparation. So basically, this can operate uh, passively in the background to, uh, to visualize what's happening in the process. So to give you kind of a high-level perspective, what happens right now is a lithium chloride brine solution normally would have to undergo a series of uh, reprocessing to get rid of certain components to prepare it for the current OEM crystallization method. Um, the reason for doing that is that if you can't control this sort of crystallization downstream here uh, very efficiently, you better do everything you can to make this input feedstock identical so that you don't have to, you, you're, you're, you're assured that the, 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 the input is, is always the same. We took a different route and just said, look, look, we're going to use that same chemistry, except we're going to constantly adapt our process to, to meet the needs of whatever lithium brine is coming in. So we have variation in how the crystallization can happen to achieve the same kind of goal. Now, why this is so tricky with lithium carbonate? 
First of all, it is what's known as an inverse solubility material. Uh, actually, as you heat it up, it crystallizes, which is, which is good, but also a little bit weird in terms of handling things. What it also means though, is that um, it actually has a very narrow saturation. There, a single batch of this, if you swing between sort of zero and hundred degrees, it's only about 10 to 12 grams per liter. So it's not really a high throughput type material to do a recrystallization using this. The concentration of brine coming in usually is in this kind of range about here. Now, the interesting thing that that is that solubility curve is true for pure lithium carbonate in solution. However, we're not dealing with pure lithium carbonate. The, the, the brine we're dealing with is, is contaminated with calcium, uh, sodium, and other components. And what happens is you get common ion effects. The solubility curve that we've defined here, even if that was perfect and we knew it really, really well, the problem is as other compositions like sodium or potassium change, the concentration and solubility of lithium carbonate will also change. So as a result of that, if you don't know what the full ion composition is, you don't really know where this solubility line lies. And as such, you can't really control your process. Um, in addition, if you don't understand where on that supersaturation curve you are, it's very difficult to control your crystallization. If you have uncontrolled growth, generally what happens is rapid nucleation agglomeration of the material which traps impurities from the solution phase. So you get these impure crystals that actually are holding on to a lot of the supernatant. Uh, if you can do it controlled, what you get is very cleanly defined lattices with very high purity crystals with no exposed surface areas and no inclusions. Um, so one of the view beautiful things of having something like our online analysis, we can tell if that's happening and again, adapt the process to achieve an outcome. So in this case, uh, un, an uncontrolled growth would lead to something that looks like this under our microscope, where we have these kind of puff balls and, and, and spikes. But a controlled process leads to these very long aspect uh, needles that are not only easier to filter, but also we've got this exposed surface is, is to a minimum. We don't have a lot of certain inclusions in these cases. Uh, at the same time, how we do this is we need to know what the composition is. That's where our online uh, chromatography uh, allows us to visualize what the composition is and adapt the crystallization to meet that sort of need. Um, so yeah, but this is basically a very convoluted space above the solubility curve that, that knowing where you are on this map is really the key to doing this well. Um, I'm not gonna uh, go through in hyper detail all the different steps other to say that we've now actually taken this concept, scaled it up and we have a pilot plant that's operational. So we went from our benchtop material to an operational pilot plant down in Arkansas in, in roughly three years. So the really cool thing about this is not only that we've taken a technology and really accelerated the TRL, but using this online analysis meant that we could confidently keep scaling the system up to apply it to new places without having to look back and, and do a lot more inline testing. We were, we were able to move forward with the pro, uh, process and gather enough knowledge at these smaller models that those same sort of online analysis could be used to build it up. So we're now in a system that can sort of produce a kilogram scale material uh, in the matter of about a day or so. And, and we're further scaling this and, and refining the technology as well. So the last one though, is kind of fusing these two concepts. Inline analysis allows you to know where you are on the system. So that's where you can either build a model to understand what your, your correct sort of experiment has to be. Once you understand a system, the inline analysis allows you to really uh, know how, what your control elements are. What we wanted to do is evolve this and say, well, for very dynamic systems or for a completely unknown space, how do we take inline analysis and actually feed it back to, which potentially could be an algorithm, something that's more automated even still. So this is where if we took the entire sort of scientific design process, the learn and play out to execute reactions and then design new experiments, if all of that was under the control of potentially an algorithm. Uh, so what this has led to is the evolution of what's known as a self-driving lab. Now, the difference between sort of, if you think of the two extremes, a manual experimentation, what we're talking about is a, a researcher that can do any experiment that they want. So it's very flexible. You can run any uh, different experiment on any given day. Uh, the downside is low reproducibility. There's, there's issues with, uh, with cases of, of, again, control of a reaction parameter, unless there's a lot of dexterity and a lot of sophistication or, or experience in the, in the manual experimenter. Uh, there's also infrequent learning because you're only doing one experiment at a time. And for very large experimental design spaces, that means a lot of time in order to sort of experiment through these. On the other end of things, high throughput experimentation, uh, sort of starting in the, the early 2000s, really arose to the front because what it allows us to do is survey massive amounts of data. Uh, we can get a lot of information about a reaction. However, it's a very limited parameter field. 
So for example, high throughput experimentation in, in the context of uh, pharmaceutical development, there's not that many reactions which fit perfectly well under the HDE kind of format or, or building reactions so that they can be scanned effectively under HDE is, is a whole challenging area onto its own. So what you get is a lot of information about things like amide reactions, Suzuki couplings, but you don't have a lot of uh, variety in the reactions that could be applied. So self-driving labs are meant to sort of fit in the middle of these two. It combines the best of automation where you have higher reproducibility and faster execution of experiments, but still captures some of the flexibility we're trying to actually sort of uh, keep on. So different reactions could be run uh, iteratively on any given day. Now, this concept is not science fiction. In fact, if uh, I would point you to uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Alan asper Guzik, uh, he's uh, had this paper in Chemical Engineering News where they were talking about the lab of the future is, is not science fiction. In fact, there's, there's many versions of this that are starting to come online now. That this concept of a, of, a, of, of a system which is algorithmically driven can really take shape in a bunch of different ways. And in fact, uh, Alan is leading uh, a consortium in Canada known as the Acceleration Consortium, which we're involved. Uh, but also uh, there's a, a whole facility coming online uh, with the uh, NRC uh, out of Mississauga, which is going to be dedicated to these kind of platforms and sort of developing in this, in this strain. One of the things that generated a lot of this in Canada is actually a project that I was involved with, uh, with my collaborators, uh, Curtis Berlinget here at UBC, and again, Alana Asperguzic at the University of Toronto. We were able to build what was the first self-driving lab for thin film materials. So what this uh, was allowed to do, this was known as Project, uh, project Ada, and um, it allowed us to survey what composition and also what formulation is necessary to create a component of a thin film uh, solar device. In this case, it was a whole transport layer for uh, what would be a, a perovskite solar cell. And, and what was really interesting about this is it allowed us to test this concept out, uh, evolve the hardware, but then also start to generically uh, template this as how else this, this type of a concept could be duplicated for, for any other problem. So if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about uh, just generally algorithmic development and this kind of, uh, uh, of algorithm driving for, for experiments, there's a couple of papers I would definitely recommend you check out. Uh, first, there's this uh, ChemSoc Rev by Frank Glorious's group, um, cheaply known as Machine Learning the Ropes. Uh, it's an excellent uh, uh, sort of survey of how ML can be applied in synthetic chemistry and what to do and what not to do. So it's a really good sort of starter point to, to sort of understand the language of ML and also uh, where it's been applied to, to synthesis. There are uh, this group by uh, Tiago and Daniel that uh, is, a, is a sort of a focus on uh, these sort of self-built uh, algorithms which are adaptive and can be used to, to basically really uh, restrict the number of experiments necessary in order to optimize a chemical reaction. So this specific uh, example is, is one really nice sort of ML toolkit ready to go and, and again, an approach that actually works across a number of different reaction classes without having to sort of re-optimize the, the ML toolkit uh, for every case. In the same uh, vein, uh, this, this paper in uh, Nature early this year uh, by Abby Doyle, uh, really what this one showed off is uh, that, that if we're gonna do uh, optimization in a batch kind of format, we need to do batch Bayesian optimization. And that's, that's again, a specific sort of challenge from the data science point of view. Uh, Abby's group created a, a very uh, simple GitLab repository for a, a tool known as Edbo, which allows uh, the average synthetic chemist to start to use and play with Bayesian reaction optimization. So again, a really important uh, bridge between uh, learning about uh, Bayesian optimization and actually applying it. And finally, so, uh, this, this paper in, in Matter, uh, done, uh, led by uh, Benji Moriyama, who's, uh, who's one of the, the real pillars in this field, uh, for uh, self-driving labs. Um, he's uh, out of the Army uh, Air Force Research Lab. And uh, he put together this community perspective on where this kind of uh, area is growing. How is autonomous experimentation developing and where is it best applied? So looking back at sort of our, our sort of general toolkit, what we learned from Ada is that the, the general process of sort of uh, reaction discovery and reaction optimization is gonna follow or really any scientific question follows something that we should all be very familiar with, right? There's sort of a phase where we do a hypothesis generation. We do a phase where we do our actual experimentation, testing our hypothesis. And then we have another phase where we observe, analyze, and refine our hypothesis. And this, this is the, the something canonical to everything that we are used to doing. 
So if you think of this kind of fire triangle, these are the three pieces that you must have. Each of these pieces, if you're gonna have an, uh, uh, a self-driving lab, you require automation at each of those corners, but you also need a really clean automated link, either data or hardware between each of these uh, pieces as well. So what we wanted to uh, what challenge uh, for a project with Merck was how do we reduce this kind of a general concept to any reaction? And what we've looked at was first of all, on the execute side, that means we need to interact with standard automated lab reactors. And there's, there's a whole host of these. They can be as simple uh, as we've demonstrated in their modules as case, as something like a, uh, a hot plate that just has serial communication or as sophisticated as a chemistry, a full sort of automated dosing robot. On the analysis side, again, that's what we've done quite heavily. That's where we take samples, we remove them in an automated way, and we analyze them. And that's sort of things like spectroscopic in situ tools or our online HPLC are ways that sort of kick that in. And then finally, schedule or decision making is, is the role of the ML algorithm. In this particular uh, package, we were using the ChemOS package. This is a, a, a tool that was built by Alam Asper Guzik, where the, uh, both the algorithms behind it, but also some of the communication is baked into that, uh, that ChemOS piece. So putting it all together, again, this is a project that was led by uh, Melody Christensen and my group. I'm happy to say that this work is now published in uh, Communications Chemistry, uh, and, and the, the reference is there if you'd like to sort of look at it into more detail. But this was a, a Herculean lift. If you look at this, it required people from many different backgrounds in order to sort of put these pieces together. But now that this template exists, it's something that we're starting to replicate uh, in many different ways. So to take you through a little bit about our motivation here, the goal behind this was not to be the first that does algorithmic chemical optimization. We'd seen some of those, but from the hardware perspective, something we saw that was missing was really uh, application of this optimization in a batch mode. And by batch, what I mean is, assemble all the reactions in a vial, let the reaction go to completion, analyze and isolate. Uh, and why that's difficult is because there are many different physical characteristics that are unique to that batch mode that a lot of the other sort of optimization was focused on uh, simple manipulation in a, uh, in a continuous flow. So basically bringing materials together where, where reagents are pumped together. That, that, that pre presents a, a slightly easier sort of ingestion uh, tool for, for these algorithms. Um, what it also meant is we have to come up with a bar. In this case, we went back to the Suzuki reaction. What we're doing here is we want to actually carry out uh, a CC bond formation at this vinyl tosylate. But most importantly, it's not just about reacting to completion. We want specifically this retentive product. We want this one stereochemistry to be evolved. Now, why that's challenging is that actually for this substrate, it actually wants to do the other. It wants to actually undergo that CC coupling to produce the wrong stereoisomer. Uh, the reason that that happens is because as we have different palladium ligands, there's an, another sort of competing or confounding pathway where certain intermediates can be accessed to give you these kind of uh, enolate structures, which allow those bonds to rotate. So this is an ask of the system that's not just about, okay, give me the highest yield, but it's highest yield with control of a very complex physical organic surface. And in fact, we are we're asking the system to actually go against its thermodynamic uh, preference. We want to actually reverse that and go to a material which is not normally the synthetically uh, most viable or, or the lowest energy sort of intermediate products. So in order to accomplish that, the kind of the area we wanted to look at was uh, these kind of major parameters. We said that we're allowed to change what ligand we use. So this is a categorical optimization where we're physically changing which ligand is being addressed. We're changing the palladium to phosphine ratio. So that's how much of the, that, that catalyst metal to the palladium exists. And that's controlling sort of the ligand environment. We're changing how much palladium is in the system, the aryl boronic acid equivalents and the reaction temperature. So those are knobs. What we're asking the algorithm to do is find some conditions here that gives us the highest E yield, the lowest Z yield, the lowest palladium loading and the lowest aryl boronic acid. So we're asking it not to just find best, but actually balance the number of these parameters in terms of maximum and minimum characteristics. Uh, this would be executed as batches in these eight loops, uh, uh, eight, uh, 15 parallel loops of eight individual points. We're learning on eight reactions at a time. And the, the ligand set that we chose was actually what we felt that initially was fairly broad. It was based primarily on what we knew uh, were sort of effective ligands for different kinds of controls, but it was really kind of arbitrarily chosen that, that these were just the ligands we would choose. So what the, the ML is doing, uh, very, very oversimplified. If you imagine that the things we're gonna change 
is there are manipulated variables. So those are our concentration or our ligand. The responding variables, that's how the, the reaction actually outgoes. What we're gonna do is carry out a, ser a series of measurements within that design space. And then Gaussian process uh, will actually go through and predict, this is what I think the actual uh, function is that relates the things you're changing to what you think you're observing. Now, next though is uh, unique to Bayesian is it kind of looks at this and says, well, based on what you've measured, these are the areas of uncertainty that I think are gonna be here. And we can identify large areas and small areas of uncertainty. And those are valuable because you can actually have the algorithm choose to explore, which means go to areas of high uncertainty and learn more. And we can do something where it can exploit. You can find an area that's doing quite well and then do sort of more like a gradient of sense to, to optimize here. Now, getting this part right is critical to making the ML algorithm work well, because if it focuses too much of its time on exploring, it will spend all of its time filling in gaps, but you never get to a maximum. If you exploit too heavily, what you get is the system will find an early hit and then it will stick to it and it becomes blind to what might be a, a global maximum. So this is a very tricky balance that, that has to be sort of struck. And this is something that in particular, uh, the Griffin uh, optimization code that uh, Alana Spirguzic has, has developed does, does quite well. So this is what our output kind of looks like. We're varying the palladium ratios, uh, the palladium loading, the aerobronic exquisite, these are all the sort of pieces that, we're, that we were changing. These are our outputs, the Z yield and the E yield. And what we find as, as a ranking against different ligands, the algorithm has selected uh, ligand seven here and a little bit to some extent ligand one. You can see it spent more of its time. There are more experiments run on these ones as opposed to some of the others where only four experiments were tested for some of those. So what we're saying is this is the final evolution where all parameters are being optimized, it's actually gone through as the experiment and begun to focus or spend more time or more experiments in its budget on these ones that are seen to be a successes. In fact, the cool thing is it was able to identify conditions here, which matched uh, the best case conditions that we'd seen from other rounds of, of normal sort of high throughput experimentation. So in, a, in a, a shorter experimental budget, it was able to navigate this very convoluted space and actually find what we consider to be uh, best case conditions. Now, the downside with this was it didn't really allow us to find anything better. We, we had a hit that matched what we knew, but it was a little bit of a letdown because we didn't find anything outside that box. And this is where we realized we, we'd actually really screwed up. Building this whole system that was capable of exploring inside a box we had defined, that was one operational challenge. But in order to, to do better, you need to step back and, and give it sort of more free reign. You need to give it a bigger experimental box to actually look into corners that you may not have actually explored. And what that came down to us was uh, looking at a different uh, design space. It was actually going back and systematically changing which ligands we use. And that was through a partnership with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the group at, uh, at Utah, uh, Matt Sigmund's group, in particular that, that does this sort of parameterization and, and PCA analysis. So what we did is take 365 commercial phosphines, cluster them using PCA, and then from that say, what are representative ligands within this larger design space that we should be testing in order to get a better understanding? And from that, we have this new set of these uh, uh, 24 clusters to actually sort of visualize. So now with a new question around which categorical ligands to, uh, to use, this was put back through the system and we get a new uh, plot like this, where now again, same algorithm is actually focused, found this new ligand, ligand 30. And not only that, it's actually found uh, a, a ligand that we had originally rejected under some other HTE experiment, but it's found a condition that actually uh, is superior, in fact, better than any of the other sort of uh, uh, ligand applications we've done now too. So lesson learned here is it's two parts. The system has to be able to navigate the space but your question, what you give to the system has to be properly designed for any of these kind of autonomous systems to be highly effective, both in terms of their speed, but also what they, they, they find. So that really summarizes these different pieces. And again, that's kind of uh, the, the, the sort of end of really what we've sort of come as far as an evolution. Building up these uh, analytical tools allows us to look inside reactions and know what's happening. Then building up the automation means we can run the reactions and analyze them on the fly with no person in the loop. This last evolution of adding uh, the ML driving algorithm means now we can start to target generically these kinds of questions, either for optimization or discovery. 
And it's really, uh, this, is, this is the interesting part that we're certainly focusing on as we grow the group next. So with that, first of all, again, massive thanks to, to my group. Uh, this is a relatively old photo uh, that we've had right now, uh, but I, I'm, I'm deeply indebted to being able to work with these uh, fantastic scientists. Um, I, again, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you today, and, and I'd love to uh, answer any questions that you might have. So thank you guys very much. Thank you very much for a, for a wonderful lecture. Um, I'll open the floor to questions and um, invite people to either uh, type a question in the chat or just uh, raise their hand um, using the, the reactions uh, feature of Zoom and uh, ask a question, unmuting themselves. Um, I think I'll start off. I, I have an, oh, we have a question. Uh, Jan or Yan, please go ahead. Jan, pause. Or Yan? Or you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. First, thank you for the great talk. I really appreciate how you combine the experimental tools which give you reproducible data, which is very important, I think, for machine learning, right? That you yeah. have, because I see lots of talks where they um, use kind of um, ICSD or data sets, which are not the same, but I think it's very good. So I have a question when you have something, you have experiments and um, the computer shoots something which is kind of dangerous. What kind of safety net do you have inside here that something goes not running through up your entire lab? Right, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And this, this also sort of touches on sort of the last point I, I was trying to touch on of, of your experimental design space has to be very carefully considered before you push go. And, and so the, the quick answer, what do we have in, 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 uh, in place? Um, we can choose what parameter ranges are, are, are allowed as, as one component. And if we happen to, to let's say, allow a combination where, where some combination was, would be considered to be uh, dangerous, we can actually add an initial cost function to that. We need some qualification that says why it might be dangerous. So we do need some prior knowledge. But we can say all things are possible, but if you choose to go here, there is a negative penalty. We can think of it as like uh, tuning the exploration parameter to this, where sure, we don't know there, but are you sure we need to? Right, so potentially that's one way to, to penalize it. Uh, but but really, what that comes back to is is again, you have to think about it's a balance between designing a a bubble for experimentation which is big enough to make this worth your time. So you're not just grinding through the same things you always know, but at the same time, doesn't ask a stupid question. For example, in one of our first parts, we allowed the palladium concentration to go up to equimolar to our substrate as a first pass. And what we found was, guess what? If you use stoichiometric catalyst, the reaction is good. And that's just stupid, right? That's, that's a null answer that, that, yeah, it falls out. But that's that's the fault of us of think carefully about what you're asking. These things are black and white, which means you have to add these kind of gradients of do not do or do certain things based on the same judgments that we might apply. Cost of reagents or time or... Uh, the material precipitates or something else has to be added to sort of down select what you choose to or not. Yeah, I mean, uh, also in a different point, like when you use Python, Python, you do uh, something over and over again. And there's always some kind of an error, and the error progress and progress. And so when you say you move your um, reaction always two millimeters next to each other, after yeah. a time it will not do two millimeters, it will do three millimeters. And this can ruin everything. So the Absolutely. You work together with Google because they have kind of a media pipe, which would probably can uh, as control of it. No, very important. And again, that's where we've, as we've learned, it's not just about what do we want to run, make sure the system can run it, assume the right reaction was run, but we actually have to build in controls to test some of those, those, those assumptions. So for example, early on, we had the code asking for volumes that were not possible for the system to run. So the, the algorithm would say, I want you to run this, this, this concentration. 
That information goes to the robot. The robot goes, I can't do that. I'll do this instead. And that information never made it back to the algorithm. So what that means is that's like a, think of that like an advisor student relationship with bad communication. I want you to run this. Students like, I'm running this instead. They come back to the advisor. It didn't work. Oh, that's, that's strange. And you make decisions based on the wrong information. So creating bi-directional communication with the algorithm of, I want you to run this. Here is what actually happened is really, really, really important. It helps you through noise rates too. Great. Drew, go ahead. Awesome. Um, I can't turn my video on, so you can't see my my face, but a very nice talk. I enjoyed Thank that you. quite a bit. And I just had a question, you know, for, for the research you do, obviously you're involved in a few different scientific areas, but where do you largely see the bottlenecks? Is it in the instrumentation? Is it the computational power and techniques? Is it the, um, the availability of interesting, impactful scientific questions? Is it people who speak both languages, as you mentioned, or is it everything or none of those? I, I'm just curious, where, where are the bottlenecks? I I don't think it's a one size fit all, unfortunately. I think that um, the, the pain point, if you ask me the same question, I will give you an answer depending on the time of the week and which group meeting I've just seen. Um, so I think the uniform, the, the same three that we constantly hit. Um, okay, lack of scientific questions, absolutely not. We got tons of problems, right? That's That's easy. Reducing the need in the scientific problem to an actionable experiment and more sophistication between who needs the answer and who's running the experiment, that is a big thing. So reducing an app, like we have to solve global warming. Okay, what's your experiment one? Where do you go to the bench today and do, right? That, that tract is a, is a scientific design and experimental design practice to reduce that abstract to, a, to an action. That's a big thing that I think everybody needs to do better. Why that's important is then on the hardware side, there are some experiments that would be phenomenal for us to execute, but we often find ourselves in this triage space where, okay, cool, what I really need to do is vary the rate of addition of this substrate into this substrate. Oh, but that's air sensitive. This is too expensive. I don't have that substrate. You begin to prune what you actually want to try. Before you know it, you're running the same experiment that everybody around the world is doing. And that's because the hardware isn't ready to do the, the ask that you want in a flexible enough way. So, you know, that, that you end up with this chicken and the egg of ask a good question, build a better tool. And before you know it, you can be pulled way off target. And then number three is, is, is completely that communication issue. There are phenomenal solutions in data science, in, in synthetic chemistry, in inorganic chemistry, where there is not enough population between those groups, where the solution to the major problem you need was invented in the paint industry in 1950. And none of that information made it back to you. Uh, so some of that is, is hopefully captured by some of the larger data initiatives and better communication tools that are coming. But we speak very different languages because the outcomes we're looking for are different. You know, fine chemical versus uh, pharma versus you know natural resource extraction have totally different metrics and 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 you know allowable timelines for discovery. And because of that, there's been this this barrier. And I think that as silos kind of start to come down, we're going to see a much better uh, sort of population. So I I highly advocate for we'll start at that third one because solutions exist. Understanding where they are will help us through these other two spaces, frame a good problem and build a better tool. Okay, yeah, awesome, thank you. I see a long list of names here who are people that are hopefully gonna be able to do that very well. Thanks. Thank other questions? I have a question. So so one of the one thing that, that I wasn't quite clear about, you were talking about the, the phosphine ligands and you started out with a set of like four or five and then you move to a set of something like 300 just based on everything that, that was available. And I wasn't yeah. clear how you went from one to the other. Was that a th computational study to see which things would work best and then you, you pick those? Or how did that work? Like why so, did you start with yeah. that? So two pieces. How this first one was set was we said, look, we don't trust the system. So therefore we will choose ligands that we have data that existed on. So prior art said, these are what, this is the space we're gonna go. We're gonna go to areas that we know should be wins and losses because there's some known knowledge here. We're, we're trying out the tires, so, but, but highly biased, right? We, we, we are going where we already have dug. 
And, and again, we were very sad initially that, oh, we didn't find better, but it's like, well, duh, you, you're digging where you dug. So yeah, that was, that was number one. Number two was a, this is the art and beauty of, um, of Matt Sigmund's group. What we said was, look, there first, we need a phosphine. We will take a list of known phosphines. We wanted to things that could only buy. So we were not going to consider things we had to synthesize. That's where that first 365 came up. Next, we did what was called uh, a principal component analysis k-means clustering. What we, we're doing there is we say we compute properties for all of these ligands like uh, cone angle, polarity, molecular weight, all the different individual, we reduce them from being a, a molecule to a set of metadata, right? Mm -hmm. And then based on like, let's say 20 different or a hundred different parameters, principal component analysis reduces that and says, you know, if you, if you imagine this, this hypercube in a 2D space, this is kind of the clustering you would get. So within this artificial principal component of one and two, we have these clusters. And from that, we said, okay, 365 ligands with these parameters can be reduced to 24 unique representative variables. So think of it where we said, all people have all these different points, but we're going to group them according to country. And I want one representative from every country. And that was, that was arbitrary as far as which one was there. There's a bit of a choice of like what we could actually buy and things like that. But that's how we sort of reduced it from 365 to 24 best guesses to kind of to circle. What would normally you normally do if this was like a, a multiple round is you might uh, in that first round pick two from each, 48, right? And then based on that, we might get a pattern that says these three clusters seem to be better. So we'll do another refinement around representatives from just those three. So it becomes a focusing or filtering sort of exercise. But that strategy of progressive triage and experimental data is, is honestly, that's a field unto its own because the, the earlier you introduce bias to, to triage experiments, the faster you screw yourself up to actually sort of say, well, I'm just going to find what's already been found, right? The value that I see with this is we can keep the net as large as possible until the last possible second. And those triages, those end corners of dark space that we have not checked, that's what I'm after, right? Mm -hmm. Run the reaction that nobody would think of doing because why would you? No, no literature says to. But there's actually you know, data that says you should go in that direction. The vector says go there. Yeah, that's that's really, really smart, smart way to do it. Mark, you have a question. Yeah, I'm just trying to get my video to come on, and I think it is. It is. Yes, hi, Mark. Jason, uh, fantastic. I learn something every time I talk to you about what's going on in your lab, and uh, I, I've talked to you enough to to uh, be surprised all the time. The number that of is high praise, man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the number of systems you're working on is just crazy, and I love it. Um, of course, uh, we're hoping to do some work on the lithium brine with you. The uh, questions I have, there's a, a couple simple ones. It looks like what you did is you went and found these uh, 24 clusters, independent, and sort of you just found them and then went back to the experimentation. What about yes. doing some of that in situ where the computational simulations are driven at, in, in in parallel and one at a time and you find something new and you drive that in Are, have you done any examples of that no we haven't and again so what you're talking about there is actually the next evolution where you could imagine there's an optimization loop in this kind of the virtual space about what what model might be applicable and then that's being continuously populated back by what data is telling you right and, and you need a really mm -hmm. good synergy and sort of this ball passing you know the, the model we know and love, like the, that we've seen as researchers, right, is let's say we do a basic study on a system, we understand a little bit about, we have a sort of a working model. That model, we talk to our computational uh, colleagues where they can help to refine it with the DFT model and suggest, well, go look over here. And there's that sort of, mm -hmm. we know what that loop kind of looks like. But to be able to turn that back where both sides of those are represented by, by sort of a script and that live data one at a time is actually refining, uh, let's say, a physics-based model as opposed to sort of just Gaussian or Bayesian, right? That would be really cool. And, and it's, it's not, we have not realized that, but there are definitely some people um, in this space that that's, that's exactly where they're going because uh, as computational power progresses, it's possible to do that with at least as much time as the experiment would take, right? 
Um, but, yeah. but definitely we haven't we haven't entertained that yet. Yeah, and and a, another basic question: self-driving or autonomous labs? The idea of that is um, get better re repeatability, reproducibility, get better fidelity, lower cost, uh, less material use, yielding potentially lower cost. Are you finding that? Um, and are you learning more about that as you develop the systems and, and evolve the systems to uh, respond to the questions you're asking? Yeah, I think at the moment, I think we're still in that early design space where it, it would be it would be a misnomer to claim that what we are doing is radically better than the best person in this field. We're not there yet. We're still learning a lot about how best to apply these. But what we're starting to see, especially in the in the application of the less than best in the world group. Uh, in the case here, I'm actually using sort of my own uh, graduate students as sort of a test case. Mm -hmm. If they're coming into the group and they're trying to execute, let's say an optimization of a reaction parameter, and they've never done this before, they are, they're novice into it, having this ML sort of like armor help them is number one, there are some really good cases that we've seen where having a student uh, work back and forth, not late in a fully autonomous way, but let's say run a batch, inquire with the algorithm, come back to the batch in a systematic way, has started to lead to way faster on target hits and, and reduction of, uh, of sort of a lot of red herrings. Uh, but second, and, and yeah, so I see that because there's a, system, a systematic nature to what they're doing, which is very, which is not trained as sort of a normal go find with your senses kind of way. Um, but second too is, if you're going to interact well with an ML algorithm, it requires your analytical game to be usually to a higher level than you would normally do. It requires mm -hmm. this 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 sort of moment of free thought with your automation that that is that is breeding a kind of a culture in our experimentalists that I think is super valuable. So we're starting to see practical demonstration where these algorithms can help you to get on target quicker, but also uh, just from a cultural thing being doing science in this manner has longer payoffs than just, you know, hey, we're getting a, a robot to do this for us. That's not the case, right? What this is seeing is the graduates, like I often refer to this as this is my Tony Stark suit of armor, right? The graduate student now enabled with this gains superpowers. So a student can actually crush 10 projects in their PhD instead of one. And that's because they're spending their time on that introspection, what should I use kind of question as opposed to, I'm trying to separate two spots on TLC. That's what I graduated to do, right? That's that's the goal of all this. Very cool, very cool. Thanks very much, Jason. Thanks, Mark. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, I know that we are over time, so um, I will draw this to a close. Jason, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all the BIMR members and all the audience today for a really fantastic talk. <clears throat> this has been a great start to our new uh, seminar program in the BIMR, and uh, I really appreciate your time and willingness to do this. Thank you very oh, much. Really, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. This was great. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I will end the uh, the meeting now and uh, wish you all a, a great weekend. Take care.